All right. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Carrie Casey, and I work for Newcastle County. And as, as, as of last night, I was appointed to general manager of the Department of Community <laughs> Services. <laughs> so I, today I've been doing that like a couple of times. It's funny. It's fun. Um, and I appreciate the, the claps. I really do. Um, but today we're here to, for a wonderful evening ahead. I'm really excited about this. Um, it's the one-year anniversary of the Hope Center, and we are going to be showing you a video, a movie, a documentary that's just truly a gift. And <laughs> I'm going to try to get through it without getting upset. So my job, <laughs> and we get back to my job, is to talk and welcome everyone. So welcome um, each and every person. I, I could spend the next 90 minutes literally going person by person here because each and every one of you in this room has been part of making the Hope Center a success. And as you've seen from the statistics, when we've had over 900 people come through the doors, we've had 41 animals, which, you know, we sometimes question that decision, but, you know, we did it. Um, and we're still doing it, um, as well as the fact that right now, currently, we're housing a 90-year-old woman who lost her daughter from COVID-19 and was displaced. So. For those reasons alone, um, to me, the Hope Center has played a really wonderful part of Delaware, and, and it's just really been an honor of a lifetime to be part of it. So I want to welcome everyone back to that. Um, I would also like to acknowledge County Executive Matt Meyer, who um, really had the um, faith in us and support and we went by the, his motto this day a year ago, don't let perfection be the enemy of the good, because we were a little messy, we still are sometimes, but um, to have that kind of support really was the, really the wind beneath us as we worked through this. Um, we're also really honored to have Senator Lachman here, Tizzy Lachman, yay! And, but, but tonight, if it's okay, we're gonna say that she was the chair of the committee to serve the most vulnerable. So really, it's her fault we did this. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but but she, she and her co-chair, who's in the audience there, Marcus Henry. Marcus, hello. He co-chaired this committee that, that the county executive put us all on, and he put some really big troublemakers on that committee. Um, and we had the out of, thought of the out-of-the-box out of idea to do something like this. So um, Marcus, who was just retired from the Department of Community Services, he was the long-standing uh, general manager of our department for a long time, and he was another person that was like, we support, do what you need to do to get this done. And he negotiated the sale, too, which I, you know, we, we, we forget to acknowledge that sometimes because he just was so supportive through the whole thing. So it really does take a village, though. And as I look around the room and I see folks, again, I could call each one of you out by name. It takes a village. From our medical providers, we have Christiana Care here. We have Dr. Gibney here. Um, from from our nonprofit partners, Friendship House, Family Promise, from the city of Wilmington, which the city, Alan Manis is here from the city of Wilmington. The city of Wilmington actually has put a, a considerable amount of funding into operating the Hope Center, um, as well as many of our other partners, Danielle and her team from the Hope Center that run the Hope Center. They were with the Sheridan, and they came and stayed with us. Um, so Danielle and her team. So there's so many people that I could acknowledge today um, and wish that I could, but we have this wonderful film that we're gonna that we're gonna watch in a second. And again, it's a gift. Um, after the film, we're going to have a panel, and so the, you'll see that as, as you see there. That is not a mirage; that's real. And we also have a couple of surprises. And I can say one of them is not that we're buying another hotel. <laughs> that's all I'm gonna say. That's all I'm gonna say. So. Uh, yeah, well, I, well, originally, yes, that we, when we gave the county, real quick, when we gave the county executive his, we thought it was so exciting, we all had Hope Center badges made, and we were so excited to give the county executive his, and I'm like, I have a gift of surprise for you, it's so exciting, and he was like, is it in another hotel? I'm like, no, it's a name badge, uh, so he wasn't, it was kind of like, I felt like we had to lower expectation after that, um, so, I'm, so before we begin, I'm going to ask the producer, Okay, Kyle Gra Gratham from the county, Newcastle County, who was with us um, as we worked through, produced this film, 
Um, and he's going to give a couple of words and get us watching this wonderful gift. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Carrie. I appreciate that. Uh, my name is Kyle Grantham. I'm the digital media manager for Newcastle County. Uh, Matt brought me in uh, when, when he came into office, and uh, we have done nothing but grow our digital media adventures uh, since then from a couple of ragtag uh, cell phone videos to uh, now a 20-minute uh, documentary piece that we've made in partnership with Short Order. Uh, like Carrie said, the, the Hope Center project itself couldn't work without countless partners. Uh, this piece could not have come together without Carrie's help, without uh, Kim Eppenheimer's help, uh, without Nicole Waters' help, um, and without the county executive trusting uh, me and our team uh, to, to dock this out. Um, and I really want to thank the county executive for having that faith in me, uh, for, for letting me take on this project uh, that I originally told him would take four months. And uh, here we are a year later. So, you know, uh, we didn't quite hit the timeline, but uh, the big reason for that, uh, this this has hours of interview footage, um, hours of footage in the Hope Center, outside the Hope Center, uh, following individuals who have left the Hope Center, and uh, literal hours of footage on the editing room floor to get down to this. Uh, and, and we went through Christina uh, Riley, who will speak on the panel, our, our director, uh, can, talk, can talk to you about the number of edits we went through. Um, but really, we, we had to get it to the point uh, that when the county executive watched it, he cried. And the final edit, we got him. So that's when we knew it was ready. Uh, so, you know, I don't want to hype expectations uh, before anyone sees it, but that was the moment that we knew, okay, we've got, we've got the winner. Um, so I hope uh, everyone enjoys this. I hope uh, for us, we really wanted to show the human side of this. Uh, you know, we talk about the statistics of homelessness and houselessness and under under homedness, if I can invent a word, um, a lot, uh, but we don't often see the individuals uh, that are those statistics, and we really wanted to show that and show the impact that just giving someone a chance can have uh, on their life. Um, and so with that, uh, I think we can go ahead and roll the film. In the most advanced developed society that Earth has ever seen. It amazes me that we haven't figured out how to house, clothe, provide quality, nutritious food to everyone. These are solvable problems and we need to approach them as problems that can be solved. There are misconceptions about who our homeless fellow citizens are. If you have an eviction or a criminal or credit issue, it's, it is going to be a major, major hardship. And that's made it so they can't find housing. When you see families, uh, you see a mother with children, uh, you see a mother and father with children, you get a whole different perspective of what the homeless population looks like. We're in the top 20 of the states with the worst um, case of affordable housing. Near the end of 2020, we were losing the stock of readily available housing options for homeless Delawareans. We were in a challenging place. We have a gap, or in other words, an unmet need for 50,000 additional units. On any given night in Delaware, there are between, you know, 1,000 and 1,300 people experiencing homelessness. 25% of them are children under the age of 18. If you're an individual who's black or African American in our state, you are four times more likely to experience homelessness than an individual who's white. If you are a family with children, with a black or African American head of household, you are eight times more likely to experience homelessness. We're a small state, we have people who care, we have the resources. This is solvable.
Those in favor say aye. The ayes have it. In March of 2020, the pandemic was just really taking off. The Congress of the United States shut down and all of us went home. Bars, restaurants, food courts, gyms should be closed. When we reconvened and had briefings on just how bad this was going to be, we did something I've never seen. We wrote an 800-page bill that delivered $2.3 trillion in aid. These funds, in many cases, in many jurisdictions, were five times, 10 times what they would normally receive in any given year. Homeless Americans live at the margins of our society. There's a lot of different reasons why they're homeless, and there's a lot of different challenges in providing meaningful transition back to being housed. It's not just about the funding, it's about the political will. When you have the right people in place and the right leaders in place with the vision to make it happen, um, it can happen. And that bill passed unanimously. The motion is adopted. When you're working in a system that is traditionally under-resourced, it's really hard to scale up and be able to leverage those funds to really do the work. Um, but we're here now and it's really exciting. County Executive Meyer had put a few of us on a committee on how to assist the most vulnerable with this coronavirus relief funds that Newcastle County had received. When the libraries, coffee shops, even homeless day centers closed, we realized that people were congregating in front of those locations because they had nowhere to go. This population was really forgotten. And then once winter began to approach, we realized code purple shelter, when it's really cold, people just show up and sleep somewhere. Church basements with elderly volunteers making meals was not going to happen. And people were literally not accessing shelter at all. They were staying outside, camping, sleeping in their cars because there were no shelter availability and there was no place for them to go at night or during the day. With the Federal CARES Act dollars, there have been really significant increases in funding to address homelessness, specifically through the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Funds particularly set aside to help emergency shelters, congregate shelters maintain safety and stay open during the pandemic, as well as funds to help folks and families experiencing homelessness move quickly back into permanent housing. We looked at California's model, where they've spent about $700 million of their coronavirus relief funds on purchasing hotels up and down the state. And then on September 12th, the Sheraton Wilmington South was going up for auction at the end of October. We began to talk to really anybody that would listen to us about how awesome it would be if the county purchased this hotel, never really imagining <laughs> that they would do it. Right away, the county executive was on board with this, so we went and we won the bid for $19 million plus, and uh, it became our hotel. On December 15th, we started the hotel with our residents, 73 people who were homeless, and they became the first residents of what is now the Hope Center. I was a teacher. I was living in Vietnam for the last 12 years. Unfortunately, I had a stroke, so I had to come back home for medical care. The Hope Centers really helped me get organized, get, get me back in, into the swing of living in America. The name the Hope Center fits because it gives you hope. You know? It gives you hope for a better day. They really take care of you. I've, I've never experienced anything like this before and it's good. They help you grow back into what you need to do. It really took a scary time in my life and created such a positive environment for me that I'm doing well. They do anything for the kids. They try to keep them active. They have books, baby dolls. Anything that you can need for your kid, they have. It, it's really an amazing outpouring of humanity and, and, and caring, love and caring. I feel like I'm, I'm moving, I'm living again, rather than just spiraling out of control. They provide help for everyone to move forward in their lives. They're like angels, they really are angels. Yeah. I've been through a lot of ownership changes and people purchasing buildings. And when I heard Newcastle County was purchasing the building, I was like, that's never gonna happen. And then it happened. This is the best possible outcome for this hotel. 
which really never should have been built on that site. It was built bigger than it should have been. It was built in a place that never should have been filled in. It was in and out of court. It was in and out of being closed. There was a lot of litigation around it. A lot of the folks that have come here have often been through what we call survival mode. They are focused on making sure their most immediate needs are met. If they don't know that they're gonna have food for that day, or if they're not aware that they're gonna be able to have a safe place to live that night, they're gonna do all that they can to make sure they have what they need to survive. And that's not something to easily turn off. This population is worthy of this. It's hard to hear people disparage this population, especially what they've been through. And I hope that we don't go back to what it was like before the pandemic. My heart really lies in taking care of people. It's still guests coming in every single day. We're still treating them just as guests. Any needs that they have, we handle. And I'm dealing with all these great new people that I would never have been working with. Being able to be in public housing gave me and my sisters an opportunity to be safe, to be able to learn. It allowed my dad you know, to be the first in his family to graduate from high school, the first to graduate from college. When I walked in there and saw this beautiful state-of-the-art former hotel that is now a center for transitional housing that will serve thousands of homeless Delawareans and then move them forward, I think this is just the perfect way for this building to end up being an amazing resource for our community. The first day we opened, one gentleman walked in with his partner and he's like, it's great to be back. And he explained that he was an iron worker, worked on the hotel. He blew out his knee, had surgery, got on painkillers. Next thing you know, he's, he's addicted to substances. His life, he's, as he said, spiraled out of control. And here he is. I think that survival mode is hard to get out of. It's not an overnight, I'm fine, let me go find a job. You know, I'm not gonna drink anymore, I'm not gonna do drugs. It's not as simple as saying, you know, oh, if we just addressed alcoholism, homelessness would go away. It's very hard to speak in broad platitudes like that. If you're in a traditional homeless shelter, they wake you up, they get you out six o'clock in the morning. If you're at the Hope Center, this is where you're living, as if I were to check into the Sheraton. Some come not knowing what their next step is going to be. You have some who have been in and out of houselessness enough to understand what the process might look like. So you really meet people at various levels of where they are on their journey. We have now, I think a couple of weeks ago, we had 238 residents and over 100 of those residents are children. Connecting people to resources where they're being treated with dignity and listened to, I think that also is a big piece of getting out of survival mode. They're spending a half an hour talking to me about my health issues and connecting me to other doctors and, and behavioral health stuff. They make sure you uh, have all your doctor appointments. They make sure you have food or uh, mental health issues. I think they're tackling one of the toughest things to battle is addiction and, you know, it's, uh, it's an everyday thing, fighting it. We have permanent space for counseling, for mental illness, for addictions. Let's get you connected with the case manager. Let's get you connected to the doctor. And our case workers have a sense of where to meet people where they are and start figuring out what their goals and plans are if they have them. I think this is a very good example of government working very well. I hope this place stays open after the pandemic. After people experience this and they really understand what real care feels like, you know, it's gonna be hard to go back. 
now we have the ability to help them get to their next step, help them secure housing, help them overcome drug and alcohol dependencies, help them you know, to remain on their meds, get them counseling and the help that they need. Are we just gonna say we're protecting the most vulnerable? Or are we really gonna dedicate resources to do it? It's ultimately the wraparound services, I believe, that are gonna support people to, to have a leg to stand on. We have to move away from managing the crisis of homelessness to solving it. One thing I've learned from this experience is that if you have the right team and the right strategy, we can start to make headway at solving some of these problems. Seeing the joy and the appreciation that they have to know that people cared enough to purchase a hotel to keep them safe and then while they're here provide them with all the services and the tools necessary to give them a second chance at life and living it to their best potential, that's priceless. This is my house. It's a three bedroom, two bath. I just moved in about three weeks ago. Due to COVID, I was homeless. And I have three kids with autism and I have five kids total. I moved from the Hope Center. Everything is there at the center. We got connected with medical. We got connected with Autism of Delaware. We got connected with summer school. I got a job with Amazon, which was awesome. And then all these services work together to make it better before it gets worse. When I went in there, my goal was housing. And I'm so glad to be moved in. I can cook again. <laughs> If you see a person who is homeless, the only thing that's different between them and you is that they currently do not have a home. That's it. The first step to creating something like the Hope Center is empathy, is caring for each other. It's families, it's individuals, it's people with disabilities, it's people of all backgrounds, races, creeds, and colors. I think anybody can come here and find a pathway home. Wow, I think speaking after that is about the hardest thing I've ever done. Let's, let's give the filmmaker and everyone in it another big round of applause. Yeah, I still, I think you guys still get me teared up when I've seen it before. Um, yeah, first of all, thank you. Uh, thank you everyone for coming tonight. You got an invitation because you were a, a, a part of this. Uh, I was telling Kyle that uh, I really wanted to make this film myself. It would have been about 30 hours long. I would have talked to about 200 of you uh, who've all been a huge part uh, of this. Um, 
I wanted to recognize one person in particular before we uh, start a few surprises and a panel. And that is Robert is here. He was in the film. Uh, and he's a resident of the Hope Center. Robert, you could stand up. Thanks, Robert, for, for being here. Uh, and also being such, saying so many positive things to so many people. I think on the first day or second day, I remember uh, seeing your interview there out in the parking lot. So it's, it's hard uh, to know what to say, um, except to say in reflecting, today is the one year anniversary of us opening the doors of the Hope Center. And as I told, uh, we threw a little breakfast for the county government staff who have gone above and beyond. For those of you who know what county government normally does for us to acquire and open what I think is the largest homeless shelter in Delaware's history and get it operating within two weeks of buying it uh, and doing so without anyone getting hurt and then adding on all these wraparound services. So many groups and organizations who are here, uh, government organizations, state government, federal government, local government, as well as so many nonprofits and companies, individuals who've lent a hand is really incredible. I like to tell Carrie Casey that there are, when I think over the past year, there are literally thousands of things I think I could list that could have gone wrong, uh, that could have probably destroyed this whole project, and very few ways to do this right. And Carrie and Nicole and the whole team managed to, to do it right, and hopefully we'll continue to do so. Uh, it, the public support of this is something that I really didn't anticipate. Uh, maybe naive of me, the amount of public support, the number of people and organizations coming forward saying basically either with their words or their actions, we cannot let this fail. Um, and another example of that is about to happen. Um, I want to ask members of the Petnero family to join me at the podium. Cindy Petnero and Tracy Petnero Crowley, come on up. For those of you who don't know, the Pet Narrow Family Foundation has been tremendously committed to our community here and across Delaware. I think this year alone, you've given away nearly half a million dollars. Um, and so they're adding to that tonight. Um, and I think there's a something. Thank you, Sandy. Um, and so they tonight are announcing a $100,000 gift to the Hope Center. You guys, you guys saw how much money we've raised so far. So this is really, it nearly doubles the entire amount of money we've gotten in the last year. Uh, and we're so appreciative and supportive for everything you do for the community. You know that we're gonna put this to use for the least vulnerable in our community. And we cannot say thank you to you and your father and your family enough, so thank you. I want to call up, uh, we're having a panel so you guys can hear uh, from those who made this happen. Uh, Christina Riley, who's with Short Order, who's the director of the documentary. Come on forward, everybody in the panel. <laughs> Renee Beeman, uh, who's the director of the Delaware Division of State Service Center. She was a member of, the, of our Protecting the Most Vulnerable Cares Act committee and those in my office know that Renee Beeman and Carrie Casey together cooked up this whole idea of a hotel. Uh, Nicole Waters, who uh, is a longtime employee, a winner of the Jefferson Award, and she's the director of operations of the Hope Center. Kim Eppiheimer, the executive director and CEO of Friendship House. And Rachel Stucker, executive director of Housing Alliance of Delaware. And maybe Academy Award winner. <laughs> So, uh, Christina, why don't we start with you? Can you just talk a little bit about how this project came together, what it took to complete it? It took us a little while. <laughs> um, yeah, Kyle came to us, um, and we have a couple of our uh, team here tonight. We've got Zach, who's a creative director and owner of Short Order, Matt, who's our writer, and uh, Sam, the editor, and, and Josh, who's an editor, and worked on the crew. Um, 
But you guys came to us, I guess, it was this time last year. And we were able to actually get on site the first day you started to allow uh, guests in. And that was pretty exciting to be there. There was just incredible energy. It was so cold that day, I <laughs> can't remember. Um, <laughs> what's that? I had a layer. Yes, <laughs> lots of layers. Um, and there wasn't a vaccine yet. We were just getting into testing. So it was really a challenging time to bring so many people together. Um, but we were just really happy to be a part of it. We're really honored. And so we just filmed that day and just kind of observed. And then over the course of several months, we came back and interviewed um, Carrie and Kim and Nicole and everyone um, who were working on site. And then we were able to come back a few times and talk to different guests, um, which was a real, it was very moving um, to be able to just be part of people's lives. It's such a, a lot of can be a lot of transition and kind of chaotic time, but so for to have people open up to us and really give us their story, we felt really honored to be part of that. Um, and then to be able to talk with some of the um, political leadership was a big deal for us, and they really gave us a lot of time. And then, yeah, as Kyle said, we edited for many, many months, and here we are. Great, thank yeah. you. Let's give uh, Christina and her team another big round of applause. Amazing. Uh, so, Renee Beeman, you've been working with homeless populations really on the front lines in your job as state government for, for years and years. Can you talk a little bit about how this idea initially came about? And did you ever imagine when you were sitting there <laughs> talking about who knows what with Carrie Casey that it would end up something like this? Where, where's my partner in crime? I can't see. Oh. <laughs> Do you want the real story or do you want to? <laughs> uh, I see uh, Senator Lockman who uh, has to be part of uh, how this all got started. And I'm thanking Carrie because she invited me to be part of this committee. Uh, Carrie, uh, you said it best when you talked about how uh, this is the best when you see government working and how we took creative, innovative, out-of-the-box ideas, um, which we were allowed to do in this committee and to see that where we are now and how lives have been changed. Um, I, I remember back in July when we were just trying to figure out what are we gonna do? This pandemic was crazy and we knew people needed to be safe and we needed to uh, mitigate risks and we need to get people together so that we can make sure that they're safe and, and supervised. And I looked at my phone today, uh, that September 12th, 2020, when some of the ideas that we had, we actually were talking about this and actually met with a group in Los Angeles that had a project called Turnkey. And I see uh, my deputy, Faith Moore, there who helped to bring this to our attention about how Los Angeles spent money to convert many of their motels and hotels t during the COVID, specifically for families. And we kind of talked about, we actually talked to the people in Los Angeles, never thinking that we would actually have the availability, but on September 12th, I texted Carrie. I was like, oh, the Sheraton is available. I was like, can... but what's more important is that we can have dreams. We can keep our focus on wanting to keep people safe, but it takes a county exec and others to say this is going to happen. So we can dream, but we have to thank you and Newcastle County for making it happen. So I'm just so excited. I don't know what we would do. We had a meeting with some of our teams today at work. What we would do if we had to house close to 400 people today. We are full statewide, but the Hope Center filled that gap. We're excited that we're gonna build on this. This is what we do all day long in my division, is making sure that people are safe. People are housed. It's such a major problem. And the Hope Center, just, I, I don't want to cry because I'll get like Carrie. 
It touches my heart because there's so many people who are dedicated to this. And when we see that we are helping people, changing lives. Robert, I know you, but you don't know me. We helped to get you from Vietnam. And I'm just so excited, because I was like, there he is! I never thought I would even meet him, because we were on the front end, but to see the stories and see the people. Thank you, Newcastle County. Thank you, everyone involved. Um, from where we were in July, being creative, innovative, to now saving people's lives, transforming people's lives. My heart is full and I'm excited and happy that I do what I do. Thank you so much. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you. To be clear, Renee, it, it, she wasn't just the spark for the idea. Her partnership and the partnership of the State Service Center has been essential and critical in more ways than, than I can explain for this to be successful, so thank you. Uh, Nicole Waters who was a housing analyst, still is a housing analyst, <laughs> with the county doing her day job. She's added a, a second job. Um, yeah, don't add that into labor negotiations, but you've added a second job into your daily work, and that's operations director at the Hope Center. You're there, if not every day, pretty much every day. I think we let you take vacations on Zoom to the beach and stuff, as long as you're still sitting in the Hope Center. But. Um, uh, jokes aside, you were interviewed months and months ago for this film. Yeah. Um, and what's changed or what's different? What are your thoughts seeing it now compared to, you know, back when you were, you were interviewed? To then, now, I think when we were initially interviewed, um, we didn't have, of course, as many people there. So now we have so many people, so many more children. Um, I think in the beginning, I didn't have the opportunity to get to know the guests personally, uh, as you mentioned. Uh, you have your other obligations and you're working on funding and contracts and things like that. Uh, but over the last uh, few months, I've had the opportunity to really meet them and sit with them and talk with them. Um, so I think that's changed for me personally, just having more of an intimate relationship with the guest and really uh, listening to their concerns and trying to help them navigate. Um, our partnerships have grown, on-site programming has grown uh, tremendously as well. Um, we now have um, the homework club on site. We have NA and AA meetings. Uh, there are tons of volunteers and partners, of course. And uh, Delaware Center for Homeless Vets is there, nutrition classes, math clubs. I mean, I, I'm probably forgetting some things, but uh, just the tremendous support of the community and volunteers and people who just want to be there to help. So that has changed a lot in this last year. Everyone wants to be a part of HOPE and help people there. So I'm just really honored to be there. I think you also named the Hope Center. I didn't actually name the Hope Center. Um, the Hope Center was named by Grace Transportation. Uh, we were trying to come up with a name for the Hope Center. And um, we had this great idea in the beginning. Uh, Carrie and I said, well, you know what? We have the penthouse suite. Before we open, uh, we'll have this contest where whoever names it, they'll get the penthouse suite for the weekend. We'll supply food for them before we open. And then I think Sally and Kim said, no, you got to do your nonprofit status, so you need a name um, <laughs> now. And so we put it out there, and uh, Grace Transportation, who has been very um, supportive uh, since the beginning of the pandemic, providing transportation uh, for people experiencing homelessness, going to the hotels, and then they, they called again and said, what else can we do? And I said, well, we need a name. And uh, Bishop Broughton uh, said, I, I rode past one day and he said, it just came to me in a vision and he said, um, you guys are low barrier, you're accepting everyone, even pets. And he said, homeless operations providing for everyone because you don't exclude anyone. And I said, okay, you know, I think I passed it on and, and you guys all said, it works, we love it. So it became the Hope Center. So thanks to Grace Transportation, and Bishop Broughton's wife here is Reverend Dawn Broughton. Thank you. And I think many of you know that tra transportation is among the most important things. Mm -hmm. I see Senator Lockman nodding. When we first announced this, probably most of what I heard is how in the world is anybody going to get there, get to there, and get from there. So the service that the, you yeah. sort of took that problem away from us, so we cannot mm -hmm. thank you enough in addition to, to naming the whole facility. So yes. thank, yeah. you. Yeah. thank you. Um, Rachel Stucker is here from the, exec the, the, from the Housing Alliance of, of Delaware, who's probably, I think it's fair to say, the leading expert in data and housing and homelessness in, in the state. Um, 
And, uh, you know, I think the expectation of a lot of my bosses, the 570,000 people of this county, is when we spend that kind of money on a hotel, they expected homelessness to just go away. The hotel would be bought and there'd be a place for them and there wouldn't be homelessness anymore. I think pretty much everyone in this room knows it's a lot more complicated than that. There's still hundreds of individuals and families right here in Newcastle County and, and probably a thousand across the state, as you mentioned, that still need housing. What's the unmet need uh, in our county, in the state, and what's happening right now? Um, thank you uh, for that very kind introduction. <laughs> now I'm like, oh, I gotta know my numbers. Um, <laughs> and so, I mean, in terms of unmet need, um, it's significant, it continues to be significant. Um, I think it is a lot less significant because of the Hope Center. Um, that's a lot of people who have access to safe shelter that otherwise would not. Um, you know, so we operate at our organization, the 1833 find bed number. And it is definitely true that not everyone who has a housing crisis or is experiencing homelessness calls us, but a lot of folks do. Um, and so we think about that using that data to try to understand what unmet need might be. It's a statewide kind of homeless hotline. Um, some people show up at other places, but um, each month what we see is between like 250, 350, it changes quite, you know, but somewhere in that ballpark each month, um, people, which includes families, calling us who are unsheltered, sleeping in their cars, um, you know, this is statewide, sleeping in their cars or sleeping outside, sleeping in abandoned buildings, places not meant for people to be, unsafe places, um, and that's a lot of people every month. Um, some of those people may find a place to live quickly, um, but others might stay in that situation for a long time before being able to find help. Um, the other largest group that we get uh, reaching out to us are people who are very precariously housed. Um, we get hundreds of calls each month from families, um, couples, singles, any, anybody anywhere in the state um, who is about to lose their housing or has already lost their housing, is staying with family and friends, has, can only stay there for another few nights or another week, um, has nowhere to go and is panicked and in crisis because they don't know where they're gonna sleep the next night. Um, we're not the only ones that do that work and handle those calls, um, but the need is great and the need is significant. Um, and I think for a lot of folks, the solution, um, you know, when we talk about, you know, what is the solution um, is, as was said, I think very, intelligently by lots of folks in the video and lots of folks on this panel already um, is a safe place to live um, and a safe home um, for them and their family. So um, we're very excited to see our local leaders investing in housing and affordable housing. Um, as a result of the pandemic, I think it really highlighted this problem that has been there um, and is only getting worse. Rent prices are going up, not down, um, and people's incomes are not keeping up. So. Um, we're very pleased to see a lot of our local leaders here in Delaware invest in that solution um, and hope to see some more of it. So I don't know if that, if that answered the question, but. No, that's good. that's good. Thank you, Rachel. Appreciate that. I should add, uh, one thing that's happened uh, more since the filming happened is we actually uh, house sort of temporary, you referenced it, people in sudden crisis Afghan refugees who fled the war and came to Delaware working with, I think, just Jewish Family Services. They needed urgent housing for a few nights. We've housed them temporarily at the Hope Center and also families in crisis during Hurricane Ida, during the flooding, uh, came into the Hope Center. And so it's also providing a service that way. Kim Eppiheimer is the executive director and CEO of the Friendship House. Friendship House has been providing the highest quality services to most vulnerable residents for decades in our community. The Hope Center was quite an undertaking. We like to call Friendship House the concierge of the hotel, <laughs> providing all these direct services to the homeless uh, population, those houseless in our midst. For, for residents, can you describe a little bit, what's it like to transition into the facility and what's it like to transition out? Sure, yes, thank you so much for that warm welcome. So one of the most consistent things we see for folks that are first coming to the Hope Center, you see fear in their eyes. You see a lot of um, anxiety, uncertainty, and then as soon as they get the moment to sit with us and we get to welcome them to their new temporary home, 
you quickly see hope fill into their eyes. For every single person who's come into the Hope Center, they've experienced something traumatic to get there. They've lost everything. And so to be able to give them that safe landing is amazing, and it's quite the privilege that we've had to be able to do this. So that's important to note that to first come to the Hope Center, what do they have to journey? What do they travel in order to get there? And we can't lose sight of that because you don't expect them to immediately turn off all of those feelings in order to start working on their exit strategy. So we have to give them time and space and that's been a huge gift that the Hope Center has offered is that we've been able to do that. As referenced in the uh, video, the homeless shelters throughout the state require people to leave in the morning, and the Hope Center doesn't. So that allows people time to really work on their issues, whatever concerns they have. It helps to have the medical um, folks that are there, case managers all day long, every day. The needs are met. For us, we've been doing this for many decades, as Matt said, and we have not seen such consistent stability with folks who have been street level living as we have at the Hope Center. It's really a marvelous opportunity for people to be able to journey out of houselessness and homelessness to finding that way home. So once they're at the Hope Center, we really do try to fit as many of their needs as we can. They um, have access to food if they don't come with their food stamps and their food benefits. There's medical care, there's case management. There's even just the basic needs, shampoo, soap, clean towels. They get their rooms cleaned every week. It is really a wonderful way for them to unravel everything that's going on. And then once they've had that moment to realize they're safe, we start cracking the code. Where do you want to go next? One of the things that's really important to Friendship House is that we don't dictate someone's journey. We ask them, where do you want to go? Where do you want to be? And then how can we help get you there? And we've heard so many stories, as Carrie said. It's such an honor to hear the dreams, the wishes, the hopes of where people want to go, and then helping them navigate there. And you see that transition. You see how it just starts to unfold, that, that fear, the anxiety, they've, their protectiveness, the defensiveness. It starts to come down and then we become part of their community walking them through to the final steps of exiting the Hope Center which can be very scary as well because you're leaving a safe place so we make sure that they understand the services continue they don't have to leave their community they're just moving to a new location so we make sure they have access to their mental health providers the physicians the doctors the caseworkers their friends and then we also make sure they have what they need to move on whether it's household items financial financial assistance, whatever it is they need to land safely to their new spot. It's a really challenging transition, but one that's really quite beautiful to see when someone is coming out of homelessness, houselessness, and landing on their own two feet. It is miraculous. Thank you. One thing I don't think we've mentioned is that there, there have been uh, close to 1,000 residents. We're at, I think, 918 people, human beings who've all, not counting the pets, 918 human beings who've lived, uh, who've spent at least one night at the Hope Center. And we've had now, I think, right around 100 families mm -hmm. who've actually moved out yep. into stable housing, either something temporary or permanent supportive housing. I, I, I want to make sure to re-emphasize something Carrie referenced. That's, where's Marcus Henry? We, uh, Marcus Henry, there was, there was an auction, and then we won the auction, and we had something like 48 hours to close the deal. So I asked Marcus, along with Michael, is Michael Smith here, our CFO? I asked Marcus and Michael Smith to close this deal within 48 hours. It's more square footage than the county government has ever acquired in the largest land deal, and he had 48 hours. I think he did it in about 42. Wow. So <laughs> without Marcus, we, we would have lost this thing. So um, thank you to the panelists uh, for your time and insight and all your work for the Hope Center path past, present, and hopefully future as well to continue not only to make this a success, but our shared effort to protect the most vulnerable in our community and our state. So thank you. Thank you.
So our focus tonight is on the Hope Center and reflecting on its impact on the one-year mark. We have another surprise that more broadly has to do with housing and addressing uh, homelessness in our community. Uh, you know, a related challenge to the Hope Center is finding sufficient housing options for our Hope Center guests and, and everyone across our community to move into. And with the support of County Council a few months ago, we announced the creation of the largest affordable housing fund in our county's history, $30 million, uh, which we're creating, <laughs> we're creating primarily, if not entirely, using federal funds. So thanks again to uh, Senator Carper, Senator Coons, Representative Blunt Rochester. You, you heard a lot of their eloquent words uh, of support. Um, and of course, under Carrie Casey's leadership, we're eager to get to work soliciting and reviewing projects to create a rehabilitate affordable ownership and rental opportunities in our county. That's a little advertising plug uh, to reach out to Carrie for we need people coming up with quality projects. We're in a rare instance in government history where we have, a, 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 um, an, I don't want to say an embarrassment of riches, but we have resources. Uh, we're looking for quality projects and quality opportunities to address these problems. We've also been in intensive discussions with the U.S. Housing and Urban Development Agency, and I'd ask, like to ask uh, Maria Bynum, who's the field office director for Wilmington, to come on up and carry. Come on back up again, please. Um, House America is a federal initiative recently created by uh, and led by the Secretary, the, the National Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, Secretary Marsha Fudge. Um, and as Secretary of HUD and Chair of the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness, uh, Secretary Fudge invited mayors, county leaders, tribal nation leaders, and governors into a national partnership to use the historic investments provided through federal funding to address the crisis of homelessness through a housing first approach similar to what we did with the Hope Center. No uh, government local or state in, in the state of Delaware has taken the secretary up on that offer to join this House America program. And let me, House America, what it does is we commit to partnering with the uh, federal uh, Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, the U.S. Interagency Council on Homeless, on Interagency Council on Homelessness, Thank you. <laughs> to respond with urgency to address the crisis of homelessness, um, to set and achieve ambitious goals, actual outcomes for rehousing households currently experiencing homelessness and developing new supportive and affordable housing units. So not only receiving funding, but setting specific outcomes, specific standards. A lot of times in local government, we don't necessarily have the capacity, the data analysis and things like that to make really uh, serious goals and outcomes that are fair and, and high, but achievable. And so we're gonna work with uh, HUD to do that. And so today I'm signing an executive order that we're signing where they're gonna be the first government in Delaware and one of the first counties in the country to join House America. So. <laughs> I can only sign this if somebody tells me the date. December 15th. Thank you. Oh, right. Thank you. Great. So, here you go. All right. Thank, Thank you very you much. So much. Oh, Thank you, Maria. Fantastic. Appreciate it. So the documentary, we will contact you for information about distributing the documentary. It's really among, we've, we've gotten through this year in part, uh, maybe entirely because of the support of people in this room. And this facility and this effort, this initiative will not succeed in the future without continued support. So all I can emphasize to you is let's continue spreading the message about how important it is to bring people together to work across all sorts of barriers to assist the most vulnerable in our community, whether it's through the Hope Center or through other 
tools. Let's continue to support the Hope Center. And thank you so much, each of you, for what you've already done to make this successful. And thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you.